Welcome to this week's Online Academy and this is the last video for 2020 and what a year it's been. First of all, I would like to thank all our frontline workers, all of you who have been out there this year working to keep people safe. I also want to thank those of you who have joined our Online Academy and I hope you find it to be of benefit. This week's Academy is actually a highlight of the Full Year's Academy. So it's all the highlights from 2020. I hope you enjoy it and thank you very much for participating. And the hamstrings are a group of muscles that originate close to the posterior inferior surface of the ischial tuberosities. So again, the ischial tuberosities are these little prominence. So the hamstrings originate here, they travel down the leg and they insert below the knee uh, in the tibia and fibia, which means they go over both the hip joint and the knee joint. And it's commonly overlooked, people tend to elevate the leg rest on a chair without looking at the hamstring range. So it's really important that you accommodate the hamstrings, that you check the hamstring range. Because otherwise, when you elevate the leg rest, you're going to pull the person into a posterior tilt and they're going to end up sitting on their sacrum, which is going to cause damage to their skin. So how do we accommodate hamstrings? We accommodate hamstrings by accommodating the angle of the knee and the angle of the hip. So when you're assessing someone, you, if the person has tight hamstrings, you need to adjust the leg rest to accommodate the hamstrings. So the leg rest needs to be adjusted. You can see in this video here that the leg rest is going into a negative angle. So the heels are being loaded behind the knee to accommodate the tight hamstrings. And this is vitally important. The other important point is you need to open up the back angle. Because the, ha the hamstrings are over the hip and the knee joint, you need to accommodate them both at the hip and at the knee. Sitting is not a static activity. Sitting is very unstable and the body segments will buckle and bend under the pull of gravity. So our muscles provide us with the greatest form of stability. But when the muscles are no longer functioning because of neurological impairment or an illness or a condition, well then we have to use external supports and they are a substitute when muscles are no longer working. So seating becomes a substitute when the muscles are no longer able to stabilize the body. And there'll always be a compromise between support and function. If you over support a body, you can reduce the function. So it's getting the balance right. Now, the most important thing when you're doing an assessment for fixed versus flexible is to eliminate gravity. So you need to do the assessment in supine. So this is where the person is lying flat on the bed. Because when the person is sitting up, gravity is taking over and it's very difficult to assess if something is fixed or flexible. I want to demonstrate one more thing and that is how to assess for hamstrings in the supine position. So when we're assessing for hamstrings, we always ensure that we have the hip flexed. So we want to flex the hip, find the most comfortable position for the client, so don't over flex. Keep your finger on the ASIS or your thumb on the ASIS and make sure that we're not over flexing the hip. So once I've achieved flexion, I want then to see how much extension I can achieve at the knee without causing tension. And what I would do there is I would hold my thumb on the ASIS and as I extend the knee, I'm going to feel a movement there and that tells me that the pelvis is moving down the chair and that's the, what that is in sitting is that's you elevating the leg rest too much and pulling the pelvis down the chair so I want to go right back to that position and then this is the angle that I need to set the foot plate at because if I overextend the hamstrings I'm going to pull the pelvis down the seat there have been lots of studies and research done into vinyl versus fabric. And I'm going to talk you through one here, but we also have a booklet which you'll be able to access on our website and all the references to the studies uh, that have been carried out are there. So in November 2000, the infection control today highlighted the results of a study. The study found that drug resistant bacteria can survive and be transmitted through patient contact on fabric upholstery in the healthcare setting.
However, while vinyl chairs in the test were contaminated with the bacteria, it did not survive in the vinyl upholstery. This led the manufacturers, or sorry, this led the researchers to conclude that an easily cleanable non-porous material such as vinyl can be significant in infection control in healthcare settings. The research highlights the importance of being able to disinfect a person's room when he or she leaves and to disinfect the equipment that they have been using. So if you want more information on this, go to our website and you can access the guide there. What can we do to protect our patients and our service users? So first of all, ask your supplier about the equipment's infection control policy. Ask for evidence of how the fabrics and the materials in the product can be cleaned and disinfectant. Ask for evidence of their ISO certification. Ask for evidence of their compliance with MDR regulations. Have a critical look at the equipment and the healthcare chairs you are using. Could it be easily cleaned and disinfectant if the person using it contracted coronavirus or a similar transmittable disease? So people always say, well, where do you start? And that's a really important question. And we always start at the pelvis. So this is the structured order of assessment. And we talked earlier in earlier seminars about the importance of the pelvis and getting the pelvis right. Because the pelvis influences the position of the body above and below it. So getting the pelvis into the correct position is going to be key to good seating. So we always start with the pelvis. Then we look at the trunk. Then we go on to the lower limbs, the upper limbs, and then the head and the neck. So in your head, you need to get a structure of how am I going to approach this? Part one of the assessment or the evaluation is going to be sitting in their current chair. Look at how the client presents in the chair. You don't try to correct at this stage. You're going to note their posture and we have an assessment form that you can use. And this assessment form can be downloaded from our website. So that's important that you use that assessment form. If you can get consent, it's really important to take photographs because that gives you so much more information. And also, when you're looking at the person in their current chair, consider the time of day because people change over the course of the time that they're sitting out. So the part two of the assessment is looking at the supine assessment and I have covered this in a previous webinar. So you want to do it on a firm surface. It determines whether the, the deformities are correctable you're looking for the available joint ranges as related to the seated person. Now, I'll discuss this later. So you're actually looking at hip movement. You're looking at range of movement at the knee. Those are two key critical measures. You want to think about, can a desired position be achieved without resistance? So another feature uh, for design for pressure management is a removable seat cushion. So why is that important? because it allows for the cushion upgrade without affecting the dimensions of a chair. You never put a cushion on top of a cushion because that causes instability and sliding and it affects the dimensions of the chair. It means the arms are not reachable and maybe it affects the seat height. Also, a removable seat cushion allows for the cushion to be reviewed and replaced regularly without having to actually replace the full chair. So an integrated cushion if it becomes no longer functional, then the chair becomes useless. Whereas if you have a removable seat cushion, you can actually re replace the cushion without having to replace the chair. What I want to demonstrate is how important it is to not put a cushion on top of a cushion. So here I am seated in the monocle chair. My arms are loaded, my feet are loaded, and I'm very secure in this chair. But now someone has decided I need a pressure cushion. So I'm going to demonstrate what happens when you put a cushion on top of an existing cushion. So now you can see how this changes. My feet are no longer loaded. My arms are not supported. And I would tend to lean to one side really to get stability. By adding the cushion on top of the cushion, you're making the body unstable. And when the body's unstable, it's less functional and what will happen over time is that the body will start to slide because the cushion on top of the cushion will cause sliding. I got a question today from uh, Rachel in Japan and Rachel asked me about a specific cushion that they were using 
in her facility? And do I think that this cushion would be suitable for this facility? And that's difficult to say. But what I really want to point out to Rachel and to everyone is that it's not just about the cushion. You really need to adhere to the four principles. If you don't do one, two and three, it doesn't matter how good the cushion is, you're not going to get the results that you need. So we're going to go through the four principles again just to uh, reinforce the importance of these four principles which we established from the research we did with Ulster University. So first of all, number one, load the body. So by loading the body, and you've met Billy before, you can see how well his body is loaded. So here are some examples of poor loading, where you can see an incorrect seat depth. The lady's feet are not supported. Uh, in the second one, her head is not supported. And then here are some examples of improved loading, where we're using the arms of the chair to stabilize the body, where the feet are being supported. So here are some examples again of improved loading. So principle number two is provide postural support. Uh, we talked about this in earlier seminars, how important it is to get the body into a midline position as much as possible and to support that body in that position. If it's fixed, we want to accommodate it. If it's flexible, we want to correct it. So using different types of lateral supports, head supports to get the body into a midline position. And also not forgetting the importance of accommodating the hamstrings to, in order to support the body. Number three, then, is allow effective repositioning. We can't put someone out in a chair in the morning and expect them to sit in that position for four, six or eight hours. We have been trained to turn people in bed, but we haven't been trained to turn people in chairs, to stand people up or to change their position. It's really important that while they're sitting out, that they're getting a regular change of position. And one way of doing this is uh, tilt in space. And then principle number four is the appropriate cushion. And we've gone through this before about the importance of immersion and envelopment. So you need to use an appropriate surface. Uh, in the Seating Matters chairs, we use memory foam and Dartex. But it's uh, again, a really good feature of uh, the clinical therapeutic seating is having a removable cushion so that at any stage, if you want to upgrade that cushion, you can do so without affecting the chair. So to recap on the four principles of pressure management, and these are going to be key to reducing pressure injuries in setting. Number one, load the body. Number two, provide postural support. Number three, allow effective repositioning. And last, number four, is the appropriate cushion. And we deliberately keep the cushion to number four. While it's important, it's only effective if we adhere to the principles of one, two, and three. So what are some of the factors to consider in bariatric seating? So first of all, they have a, redu a reduced range of motion due to the mass of body parts. For example, legs and arms can be very heavy. The bariatric client may have difficulty repositioning themselves, and this can lead to, a re, uh, this can lead to pressure injuries, so uh, having difficulty moving in the chair. They have an altered centre of gravity. Generally speaking, the centre of gravity is, is more forward in the bariatric client. Tilt and space facilitates a better posture for these clients while maintaining their function. Another challenge we have with bariatric seating is the bulbous gluteal region, which is excess buttock tissue. This reduces the ability to make contact with the back of the chair. If the gluteal region is not accommodated within the chair, the client is forced to sit in a posterior pelvic tilt, and this will cause sliding from the chair and back pain. In terms of equipment that there is uh, available for other patients, the, the non-bariatric patient, and then when you move into that bariatric space, do, do you feel that maybe in history there was a lack of emphasis put on that type of equipment or a lack of careful thought put on that type of equipment? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It was a nightmare. I mean, it's much better now, but at, at that stage, there wasn't very much equipment at all out there. And people would, as, as Martina says, there was equipment and all people were doing was making it wider and not thinking about the body dynamics of that person. So you would get someone who would make a piece and says, I've got this piece of equipment. And then it was totally wrong. Um, with your plus size population, the equipment needs to be tailored to their individual body needs. And one size does not feel ill. And that's been my mantra, I think, over the years, is that you come with all these different body shapes, all these, all the, where the body uh, dynamics are and where the weight distribution is. And you can't take a, a chair off the shelf in some respects without doing modifications to it or without making um, changes to the, it's about fitting the, um, the equipment. It's about the patient and it's about the equipment meeting that patient's needs. It's not making the patient fit the equipment because that won't work. So we've done a number of clinical trials with the City Matters chairs to look at their clinical benefits in the care home environment. So one uh, clinical trial we did was at St Camille's uh, Hospital in Limerick. It was a long-term care hospital and they had a 100% reduction in falls and sliding with the intervention group who were assessed for clinical therapeutic seating and an appropriate chair provided. So the key there is that they were assessed properly for the chair and a proper chair was provided. And with that group of patients, they had a 100% success rate with regards to falls and sliding. With our University of Ulster trial, we had a 57% reduction in the use of lap belts due to, uh, which were used to prevent clients from sliding out of the chair. And in the Bond Secure clinical trial in Galway, we had a dramatic reduction in falls when the clients were assessed appropriately and a chair provided. So you can see that we do have the evidence there that if someone is assessed and a proper chair provided, we can reduce falls and sliding from the chair. Another huge problem in care homes are pressure injuries. So how do we reduce pressure injuries in seating for the long-term care residents? So we need to reduce shear and friction by stabilising the body. Encourage a midline posture by providing postural support. Load the body fully. Encourage a regular change of position using the tilt and space if the client cannot change their own position. Ensure the cushion is adequate to provide pressure redistribution and do not put a cushion on top of an existing cushion. It makes the person unstable and causes sliding and shear and friction. Talking about problem solving, the big problem on everyone's mind at the moment is obviously the coronavirus situation. And, you know, fortunately we're getting back out on the road. We're getting to go out and see patients again and we're doing assessments in people's homes and we're wearing PPE and we're uh, got all these brand new problems to solve. But I'd be interested here, Faye, and from your experience, as maybe some of your colleagues or people that you're working with, what types of things uh, have you adopted, new measures have you adopted to allow you to continue your care um, while respecting the, the infection prevention and control measures that we, we all must take at the moment? It's been it's been really difficult um, to get that balance, and I think as as therapists, and I was you know on a call yesterday with with some of my colleagues, and you know it's really difficult to kind of use all our all of our skills. So looking at assessing in a variety of ways, using that sort of verbal conversation over the phone, because what we we're trying to do is limit that working remotely so there's not the support of teams and I think you know it, it puts added pressure on your day especially as maybe a more newly qualified or maybe a less confident in different things and and it's it's created a variety of issues and I think you know having communicating across sort of virtual platforms with people is a whole new um, thing that we've had to do we've had to think about the etiquette of of engaging with people around permissions as well and and asking people can we speak to other agencies so We've been doing quite a lot of work with our care agencies and asking our care agencies who are going in to be our eyes for us. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and asking them to capture information. Um, we've used a variety of Zoom, Teams, WhatsApp to kind of, you know, can we do that? But, you know, we also have to be very aware that some of our population can't cope with that technology and it's too overwhelming for them so we trying to get that balance around what can we capture through a conversation with them or with their permission be our eyes and ears and if we have to go in then obviously we are going in but then we've got that added pressure of wearing ppe and in the heat last week it, it's you know it's overwhelming and um you know, I'm part of, uh, there's some different groups on Facebook around um, COVID OT and a lot of people talking about, you know, exhaustion of staff wearing face masks for long periods of time. So we've got to sort of take that into account. People that might have some communication difficulties, how are we balancing that? Can, you know, can they see us? Can they hear us very well? What other things can we do? So again, I think as an OT, we're, we're problem solvers. So we're having to be a adaptive in our approach the whole time but I think the big thing is is that it's taking longer um, to capture that information and to and especially when you're making a prescription for maybe a very specialist chair or you're deciding you know which seating company to maybe get out we don't want to be bringing lots of people into people's homes because we need to be mindful that we need to shield these potentially very vulnerable people so it's you know it's been it's difficult and I think it will continue to be difficult and I think the way that we work will continue to evolve over the next six to nine 12 18 months however long we kind of are going to live with this and and maybe for the future I think the big thing is is um, staff being confident in their own skills and I know that a lot of our staff have engaged in webinars, which they found really helpful to really understand products. So all of the companies, including yourself and this online academy, they've been fantastic in staff actually having the time to do that sort of personal development. But it's then how you transfer that into your actual working practice. The NHS in England have estimated that 49% of the people hospitalised with COVID-19 will require rehabilitation. People who have a stay in the intensive care unit for three days or more, less than one third of them will have returned to their baseline function after six months. In 2013, Barry et al reported that early exercise has the potential to decrease the length of stay in hospital and improve function in patients with acute respiratory failure. There's evidence coming from Europe and is beginning to emerge. They're reporting that people most severely by COVID-19 will have prolonged hospital stays of approximately 21 days, often spending much of this time in bed, which contributes to functional decline. So let's look at what are the benefits of getting in early and mobilising these clients early. Early mobilisation appears to decrease the incidence of ICU-acquired weakness, improve the functional capacity and increase the number of ventilator-free days and the discharge to home rate for patients with a critical illness in the ICU settings. In the early stages of rehabilitation, we might actually have the person in a semi-seated position. And what is semi-seated? And semi-sitting is also known as the Fowler's position. And it's when a patient is sitting sort of in like 40 to 60 degree, they may have their legs extended or they may have the legs flexed or bent. It's an intervention that is used to promote oxygenation, to maximise chest expansion, and is implemented during uh, events of respiratory distress. The semi-sitted position is a more relaxing position for the client allowing for improved breathing. And when someone gets out of bed in that very early stage of rehabilitation, they don't have the ability to sit upright in a standard chair. The chair that you put the person out on in these early stages must be something that's going to allow for recline and that semi-seated position. So the use of tilt and space is vital for this early stage of rehabilitation. So you know in your facility and in your organization you're using good seating good equipment good surfaces and mattresses good education um do you feel it's a combination of those things together that has helped you achieve good results 
Oh, that's a, another brilliant question. Um, we had probably the lowest pressure to prevalence nationally for quite some time and we're the leaders in that. And I learned very quickly that just supplying equipment doesn't solve the answer and that it's not just the mattress and the bed. And, I, and um, you know, any time that a company comes to me telling me that if I buy their product, I'm going to get rid of all my pressure injuries, I know that I've got uh, a tourist sitting in front of me and that whatever we, we choose, it has to be in combination. So you can be on the best chair, the best bed, the best mattress, and if you're not feeding that person, they're gonna get pressure injuries or that pressure injury is not gonna resolve. Um, people sell prophylactic dressings. If you're, um, if you're using a prophylactic dressing and you're not seeing them properly, like Martine talked about being able to adjust the back and they're shearing, that dressing's being ripped off, often, the staff blame the dressing when in fact it's the posture that is the problem because they're competing with shear all the time. Yeah. So I think that we've always got to look at, you know, um, and you know, how long we're leaving them. And people think you can just turn a motorized mattress on and forget about the patient that this thing's going to wiggle for them and do everything. And then they blame the mattress when it's, we've got to look at still offloading their heels and then when we sit them out, what, how are we sitting them out? Are we protecting them while they're in that high risk position? Um, how often are we moving them? How often are we feeding them? Uh, there's, 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 a, you know, it's, there's about 126 risk factors that are all competing with each other all the time. Yeah. Now, at this point, it's a good idea and very important to have the brakes on the chair. So make sure the brakes are on. And we're going to guide the person back into the chair and tilt the chair slightly. So by tilting the chair, we're ensuring that the client is getting good contact with the back of the chair. And we guide the person into the seat in a nice midline position. The arms of the chair are preset so that we can guide the person in easily. So the arms of this chair are adjustable in width. So if we have it at the right width, it means we can guide the person into the chair in a nice midline position. Then we're going to bring them upright into a more upright position and then support the head. So what are the goals for seating children and young people with disabilities? And the first one is to facilitate normal movement patterns or control abnormal movement patterns. To manage the pressure or prevent the development of pressure injuries. To decrease fatigue. We did say earlier that in order to maintain an upright position, it can be a very tiring and it, it's constant muscular effort. So we want the chair to support the client and the child enough that we're decreasing fatigue. We want to enhance autonomic nervous system function facilitate maximum function with minimum pathology. We talked about the challenges with seating the MS client and one of the big challenges is the spasticity and the extensor spasm that the client can go into. Now th these are challenging but I want to show you some tips that might help with that. So the first thing is is to have a chair with a back angle recline, a separate back angle recline. You can see the way the back of this chair will come into recline. What we don't want to do is over recline the client because if you put the client into too much recline, you're going to encourage that extensor spasm. So by having a chair that has an independent back angle recline, we can actually bring the person up into more flexion and that inhibits the extensor spasm. Just bear in mind, if there's any limitation in hip flexion, you need to accommodate that. So over flexing the hip is not good, but so you need to make sure you're doing an individual assessment, but that opening out the back angle slightly to accommodate the hip angle, but not over extending it to encourage an extensor spasm. Feature that will help with the extensor spasm is loading the feet. So if we bring the feet up like this, when the person goes into an extensor spasm, at least when they have something below their feet, that will cut out and inhibit the extensor spasm. Also, because of the spasticity, having leg laterals on the chair is also very important because that keeps the feet on the foot plate. So when we have the client seated well, we also would use the tilt and space. 
to get a better functional position. So using tilt and space and back angle recline separately will, will assist with the reduction in extensor spasm. So we talked about uh, a lot of ataxia and a lot of movement with the MS client. And what, one of our suggestions is to have a contoured cushion. So this cushion here is contoured so the person sits in the well at the back and it stabilises the body and reduces the sliding and the shear and the friction. Also, because these clients are sitting for long periods of time, they're at high risk of pressure injuries. So this high risk cushion is really important. Always ensure that you've spoken to tissue viability and that you have met the needs, their skincare needs. So I want to show you Anne-Marie here again. And here we have a before and after photograph. Now you can see on the left hand side of the screen, she's sitting in a typical riser recliner type chair, which is not meeting her needs. She's sliding constantly off, which is causing damage to her skin. Uh, it affects her breathing, her uh, respiration. And you can see on the right hand side, she's sitting in one of our Atlanta chairs, which is the chair that we would use a lot for the Huntington's client. Now, in this chair, you can see she's in a more upright position. Now, her posture is not perfect because we're not going to get a perfect posture with the Huntington's client because of their movement. But what you can see on the right hand side of the screen is that Anne-Marie is no longer sliding down the chair. So she's maintaining an, an upright posture even with the, the, with the movement. So I think that's important that we don't expect these clients to sit in a midline perfect posture because that really isn't going to happen. But we find that the Atlanta chair does facilitate a much better posture and reduces the sliding. And those of you who have any experience with motor neuron will know that head control is a huge problem with clients with motor neuron. And why is this important? Head control is important because proper positioning of the head may help to reduce the chance of aspiration. It may alleviate the client's fear of choking and assist with breathing respiration. Now, the important thing about head control is that number one, it's difficult, but number two, it's, it really starts with the pelvis and getting a stable base of support. So we need to get the pelvis stable, we need to get the spine and midline as much as possible, provide lateral supports, shoulder supports, and then we have a much better chance of getting more head support or more head control. So it's not just about the head. We must start down at the pelvis and make sure that the person has a stable base. If the person is sliding a lot, we need to look at that because that is going to affect head control. So head control is one of the biggest challenges with clients with motor neuron. I know it's uh, been commonplace in the past for a person who has a pressure injury or a pressure ulcer um, to think a lot about the therapeutic surface, the bed and the mattress that that person is lying on, and then the cushion perhaps, and now more so the chair. But uh, have you any opinion or, or thoughts to share on that about the emphasis, changing the emphasis from just thinking about one part of their day to thinking about the, the whole person as regards to pressure care and pressure injury prevention? Yeah, well, I, I think that in the world of seating, you know, in, in wheelchair seating in particular, you know, we used to, when we first started, it was all about the cushion. And then, you know, it was all about the cushion and the wheelchair configuration. And then it became equally important. And, and honestly, sometimes I think, I believe this wholeheartedly that the cushion by itself can never do its job and it has to be in alignment with or it used in collaboration with an optimally fitted back support because I think that if we don't have optimal posterior support then it really um, what's under us can't really do its job so I, I'm not sure if that's what you're if you're that's what you're asking me but that's what that's what I think about when I think about you know support surfaces the bed the seat the chair I like to think about the back support as well. And then the other area that often gets overlooked is in the bathroom. And um, I spent, I was asked a few years ago to do a presentation on um, seating considerations in the bathroom. And, and my first reaction was, no, I don't, I don't think I know how to do that. And then, yeah, then I thought about it and I thought, well, maybe if I, you know, expand my horizons a little bit and think a little bit more. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time uh, looking at and understanding, you know, what's the process for selecting something, something like a rehab shower commode chair, for example, because a lot of the persons that we see who are considered to be high risk, 
for skin integrity issues in the wheelchair are, like you say, they're high risk everywhere their bum sits. So for me, for part of my assessment, if I'm looking at pressure care, I want to know, the first thing I want to know is, where are you all the time? In other words, when you're not in this chair, where are you? What other chair might you be in? What toilet seat are you using? What, what are you, what's being used in the bathroom? If there's a younger person or, 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 a, or even an older person that's outdoor doing recreational activities, what, what kind of seating is used there? So we want to understand, I think it's really critical as clinicians to think about everywhere where the bum sits because it goes with us everywhere we are. And you know, if you're at risk in one place, you're at risk everywhere. People always ask us, Martina, you know, my client has a, a score of X or there's such a, a place on the scale. What product would you recommend? Is it fair to say a score of this equals a product like this? You know, can, can you make that direct comparison? Yep, I not, without, not without taking all the other clinical uh, 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 things into consideration. You just can't equate a score to a cushion or a score to a, a mattress without taking in all the other clinical elements. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, I would like Michael to, to uh, come in here and maybe elaborate on that because I like to hear from someone, another perspective. Okay, I, I tend to completely agree with you, Martina. Uh, the scales uh, were developed initially as guides to remind people of things to look out for. And they're very helpful in terms of covering major risk factors for for pressure damage. Um, but I, I would agree that any score is going to be um, a picture of someone's overall risk. Now that risk can be, uh, it could be because they're nutritionally de uh, deficient, it could be because they have continence problems, it could be because of prior surgery, it could be d due to neurological damage, there's lots and lots of factors we all take into account. For me, the, the, the risk of associating a score on a risk assessment tool with a specific product is the product will only really manage to help the immobility or the lack of mo movement of the individual. It won't do anything about nutritional impairment or continence, obviously. So assigning a score which is developed on lots of different risk factors and then trying to say that associates to one product it is a uh, it's a very attractive notion but an incorrect notion we need to look much more closely at fitting the interventions to what the risks actually are for the for that individual and that's right i, I agree that's for clinical experience clinical judgment uh, clinical awareness comes in. That everyone is treated differently and not one feature, not one chair will suit every individual. Um, and it, I think to highlight that and to highlight that continually throughout our online academy and through discussions like this is just so important. Um, however, in the clinical therapeutic seating, I know you've mentioned tilt and space. Um, we've talked about head support. Are there other features that you feel are ideal in clinical therapeutic seating or a benefit? Mm, I do think back like to 15 years ago where our seating options were kind of basic wheelchairs with not much postural support mm -hmm. or, you know, the old princess air chair. And I think of the position, the banana that those people used to be in and the fact that all the pressure was going through their sacrum, it didn't support their breathing, it didn't support under their elbows, and how far we have come, or how far Martina has come, with the ability to have a chair that has so many inbuilt features. And I think when I do seating or positioning with someone, I don't start with the chair, put the person in it and make it work. I look at what that person needs as an individual in terms of what clinical features do we need in a chair to support this person with their functional um, profile? Mm -hmm. And so if things like pressure care are really, really important, I need a chair that has really good pressure relieving properties. If head support is really important, I need a chair that tilts and has adjustable head. If someone's 
very big or very little or very tall or very short. I need a chair that I can use to be able to adjust them because people with MND, for example, will often, like more often than not, lose weight over the course of their time. So they may start with cervical onset MND and they might be quite big, you know, beefy. And then, oh, that's really Australian term, robust. <laughs> Um, and over the course of their condition, just because of the way it happens, and it's not through that the dietitians aren't doing the right thing or they're being fed, it's just the, what happens. Cells burn more energy and, and muscles waste away. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that the chair will cope with, if possible, changes in size and, and support their posture and support kind of their breathing. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can always advocate, I always educate therapists on this important of posture and how if someone can sit and breathe well, the rest of their life, the rest of their day is going to be better because they're going to have more energy and, and building the seating into that concept of sort of energy conservation because we know people with MND end up with less energy all over. So we want to conserve it as much as possible for the fun things and not have it all used up just doing day-to-day -day things. With the Parkinson's client, I want to demonstrate why a razor recliner is really your starting point because this client group stay mobile for longer and we need, they have difficulty in initiating movement. So they have difficulty getting from a sitting position to a standing position. So the use of the riser recliner will help to initiate that movement. So if the recliner is coming up and then with a slight forward tilt, that's going to help them do that initiation to get to a standing position. So when the client is due to stand up, a good tip is to get the heels right behind the knees to ask the client to slide forward in the chair. And because they have difficulty initiating movement, maybe a rocking movement or counting. So do something like ready, steady, stand, like that. This encourages, this gets them ready for that standing position. So this rocking movement helps to initiate the stand. On this particular chair, we also have um, an open dangle back. And I think that's very important to provide comfort for the clients. When the clients are in a seated position, they may need head support, they may need lateral support, because although the Parkinson's client does maintain mobility for a longer time, they do need quite a lot of postural support when they sit down. The other thing to remember is that they have difficulty with hand function. So a chair that has larger buttons to maintain, so that they can actually uh, operate the chair independently. When we talk about the specific conditions, we try to highlight the key uh, unique features of that particular uh, client. However, a general seating assessment is necessary. So although there's very specific things that are uh, consistent with Parkinson's clients, you need to do a proper full seating assessment for each client. Now, one of the features of the chair that you need to consider is pressure management because the clients will probably be sitting for long periods of time. You want to try to reduce shear and friction as well in the chair. So therefore, it's important that you have a back angle recline and tilt and space in order to give them postural stability. Now you will then find that as the condition deteriorates and progresses, that you will probably move from the riser recliner to a tilt and space chair. A question that comes up a lot with dementia patients is restraint versus safety, the use of lap belts. From my own point of view and from my clinical experience, I feel that a lap belt should not be used for someone to keep them in a chair. That we need to look at the reason why the person is sliding in the first place. So we need to look at the chair because in many cases when I've done a proper uh, seating assessment we were able to remove the lap belt because the, the reason the person was using the lap belt was because they were sliding from the chair. So if the proper assessment is done sometimes we can remove the, the lap belt if it is only used to prevent someone from sliding. We need to look at the cause of the problem and not just the symptom. But however, in many of your own areas, you're going to have your own policies about when you can use a lap belt and when you can't. Obviously, in transit, 
if the client has been moved in the chair, I would encourage someone to put a lap belt on that person, but not to use a lap belt as a form of restraint to keep someone in a chair, especially if the client is mobile. If the client is mobile, you really need to be looking at supervision around the client, not using a lap belt to keep them in a chair. I would also use a lap belt for positioning. So if someone had an unstable pelvis, I would use a lap belt to hold their pelvis in position. So there are times when I would use a lap belt and times when I wouldn't, but it has to be a clinical decision and you really need to refer to your own policies in your own area. Well, stroke rehabilitation was always my favourite place to work. You know, when I started off, that's where I worked in stroke rehabilitation and I absolutely loved it. And there were so many things to consider when, when seeing the stroke patient. So could you take me through now, what are the things you need to consider, the specific things for stroke? One of the most important things and one of the things we try and aim to get very often is reorientation to the person's midline. Mm -hmm. So when someone has had a stroke and they have a unilateral effect or unilateral deficit very often they'll lose their sense of midline and that goes hand in hand with neglect as well. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things is trying to reorientate and retrain that person to the midline and we're doing that in every kind of therapy we do you know from incipient right through to sitting out in the chair and perhaps sitting out on the plinth in other active therapy. And um, One way in which we try and retrain the person to midline and how we accommodate that in seeking is to try and load the body as much as possible and you've talked about mm -hmm. that in some of your other webinars yeah. but it is really, really important to ask yourself, how can I sensation and proprioception? Yeah, and yeah. ask yourself, where can I load the body, and mm -hmm. how can I increase the footprint of sitting? So from the feet right up to the head, we can load the body and provide really, really good proprioceptive feedback, mm -hmm. and also then visual feedback as to the position of the person's limbs on the chair. And very often, I would try and use the features of the chair, such as the armrests, rather than using pillows and other positioning aids, because we have to remember. Sometimes after a stroke, a person can have difficulty controlling their body temperature and pillows and external aids, as well as the IPC stockings that they might be wearing, mm -hmm. can cause the person to be quite warm and quite sweaty. And that's something we want to try and minimise, especially when sitting, because that's going to have a knock-on effect on their skin integrity mm -hmm. um, and risk of moisture lesions and skin breakdown and everything like that. It's really, really important to us to load the body as much as possible, mm -hmm. to increase proprioceptive feedback throughout the body, and to reduce any risks of corrective postures that you get um, when we have a lack of stability. So very commonly when the chair simply doesn't fit, when it's too big or too wide or the back angle is not set correctly, we'll see the person demonstrating corrective postures such as rotating or fixing or crossing their arms to try and increase their stability. And then that can have a knock-on effect on their tone, both on their effective limb and their unaffected limb. Mm -hmm. And something which I talked about earlier, which we see very commonly in stroke, is the overactivity or pushing reaction on the unaffected side. Mm -hmm. um, and in sitting, that can manifest itself um, very obviously, and it can cause the person to rotate, usually to that affected side. And how we would visually notice that in sitting is whenever we see a leg length discrepancy when the person isn't sitting, that can give us an indication that the pelvic pelvis is in rotation, mm -hmm. so that one side of the pelvis is further forward than the other which is more rearward and then they're not going to be making nice contact with the back of the chair um, and they're at risk then of sliding out of the chair as well. So I'm going to now cover the critical measures. We've been asked this question from occupational therapists and therapists who have difficulty doing a full supine evaluation for the client and they're maybe doing a very brief assessment. What are the clinical critical measures that we need to look at when we're seating the client? And the first one is hip flexion. And hip flexion influences the position of the pelvis, causing tilt and obliquity. And we really need to assess the client bilaterally. So we assess both hips. We see what range of movement they have at the hip because it's the key to setting the back angle of the chair, i.e. the amount of recline. And a back angle on the chair, as we've already talked about, is crucial to accommodate hip angle. So checking someone's hip angle is the first critical measure because if we can get the hip angle and the back angle of the chair right, we're going to help to reduce sliding from the chair. We want to then look at knee extension with the hips flexed. And that's what we're doing there is we're assessing the hamstring range. The hamstrings influence the position of the pelvis. They need to be assessed bilaterally and the accommodation of hamstrings is vital and it's the key to setting the angle of the calf pad and the foot plate. We talked about this earlier, not over elevating the leg rest if someone has tight hamstrings. 
and we or we need to set the foot plate of and the calf pad to accommodate the range of movement we have at the knee. The third one then is hip abduction and adduction. This position influences the position of the pelvis. If we don't accommodate it, it will cause rotation. We need to ensure accommodation of any restriction as this will have a severe implications for preventing destructive postural tendencies. So we need to look at hip abduction and adduction. And the fourth thing to assess is the cervical flexion and extension. It's important for visual field. It's a key position for feeding and limitation in flexion can result in tilt being contraindicated. So if someone has difficulty flexing their neck and they're holding their neck in extension a lot, if it's fixed in extension, you don't also want to add a lot of tilt to that person. So you need to assess if you can correct this position, even partially correct this position, maybe using a chair like the Phoenix chair, because cervical flexion and extension is crucially important for visual field, for feeding, and also for respiration. When we have someone in bed, we have been educated to change their position, to reduce shear. We have anti-shear materials on the mattress, but then we put them out to sit on a bedside chair that is vinyl, that is not supporting the client, and we are actually encouraging shear on this particular seat. So what are the main areas for pressure injury development? And you can see from this slide that one of the main areas is the sacrum and the coccyx. The trochanters are 17%, the ischial tuberosity is 15, the heels 12, the ankle 7, and other sites 13. But the sacrum and the coccyx account for 36% of all pressure injuries. Now these are not all happening in bed. In a large portion of patients, these are happening in the chair because the client is sliding in the chair and the chair has not been designed to meet their needs. You cannot put a vulnerable person sitting out in a standard bedside chair without causing some of these issues. When we seat someone out in the morning in a chair, in a, in a bedside chair, the weight distribution is 75% of the weight is going on 8% of the body, which is leading to high interface pressure. The buttock region takes 75% of the weight. The feet take 19%. The back takes 4% and the arms take 2%. Now that is in a standard bedside chair. But the difference between a standard bedside chair and a clinical therapeutic seat is that we can use the seat to redistribute the pressure. So we can actually add more weight onto the back, which is going to alleviate the weight that's going through the buttocks, the thighs and the sacrum. These statistics here are related to the standard bedside chair. We have a lot of people that are on our online academy that or maybe students, or uh, maybe they're early adapters to seating in their um, you know, facility or, or in their workplace. How would you advise someone like that? How would they make a change to get that onto the awareness of a manager or to put seating into a care plan? You know, for someone just Great. starting an early adapter, how can they uh, create change within a facility? So if, if, there, if there's definitely a gap, one of the things I want to do is I want to connect um, with my therapist who, who understands seating and have them start to look at it and just get an idea of what's going on. Um, asking questions, for example, how many people are eating meals out of bed? One of, one of, our, one of our programs, one of the key success drivers was the dietary department. Who would think? But therapy started talking to them to find out who was eating out of bed and was, and so all of a sudden now that we're talking about that and looking at how people are, are they're eating out of bed, the next thing is, well, how are they eating out of bed? Again, we talked earlier, if you're slouched and not comfortable, how can I eat? So that would be an area, just taking, a, being very, very surgical, looking at a small area and see what can we do. Also then just looking at patients when they're sitting in bed, what's going on? How many times am I going in and I have to boost a patient up in their chair because they're starting to slide. And what can we do 
uh, to, to, prevent, to prevent that or be proactive. And one of the nice things about the Seating Matter chairs is it looks at that. It talks about the importance of having good feet, your feet planted, because it's going to give that feedback to the patient and allow them to actually hold themselves more or how they're sitting in the chair. So you start looking at that. A therapist is a really good person to do that because they can start giving you the clear scientific biomechanical clinical information. And then, because then when you're going to talk to a nurse manager or a quality group, it can, when you start talking about clinical issues, it can raise, it can raise the, raise the flag to it. So once again, I hope you enjoyed the uh, recap and the highlights of the 2020 Online Academy. Next year, we will be back in 2021. If you have any suggestions or anything that you'd like us to look at or address, please uh, submit them below. I want to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a very healthy 2021. Seating Matters, we are here to help you and your patients. So if you have a patient that you feel would benefit from what you learned today, you can set up a person-to-person -person demonstration or an online demonstration to view our products and put this into practice.